Can anybody show me one single solitary even portion of a verse that tells us when we get saved, evil spirits automatically leave? Sure. How about Matthew 12, 43? How about 1 John 4, 4? How about 1 John 5, 18? Or John 8, 36? Is that enough for you? Greg Locke has recently, over the last year or two maybe, has gone through a reawakening, a new discovery that Christians can have a demon, that demons or demonic spirit can be in the same place as the Holy Spirit. And he issues this challenge, kind of in Greg Locke fashion. The problem also with Greg Locke in Greg Locke fashion is that Greg Locke simply does not pay attention to the scriptures because there are a plethora of scriptures that counter his notion that Christians who have the Holy Spirit, that is a true Christian, because only true Christians have the Holy Spirit, that they can also have demons. Can anybody show me one single solitary even portion of a verse that tells us when we get saved, evil spirits automatically leave? It's not in there. It's not in there. You so let's look and see. Let's just start off by going over one and as we'll go we'll go through some more because he's going to make a statement as a matter of fact he is actually going to cover a verse that i'm going to cover and he's going to use it to contradict himself to cut his legs off because he's making the statement that if you have the holy spirit in you in you in this vessel that you cannot have a demon now he says that he says that later on we'll get to that but let's go to a passage that I think makes it pretty clear. And there are other passages in first John 5, 18 says, we know that no one who was born of God sins. Now the word that's born is gegenemonos, which is perfect tense. So this is a past action. It's a completed action from the past. So who is born? They have been born of God from the past. This even extends back to their, obviously this thing extends back to prior to their conversion. We won't go into that just yet, but those who have been born of God, not that person sins. He does not sin, but uh, he's born of God and God keeps him uh, from the evil one or from the evil not touches him. Now, I'm kind of reading in a rough fashion because I'm reading I'm reading from the Greek and then put it in English. But the way it reads in English is that uh, he who was born of God, God keeps him. And I said God twice. You'll see why. God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him or the evil does not touch him, however you want to put it. So to say that a person who is born of God, that is born of the spirit, that's what the word is. Uh, we see this when Jesus brings us up in John 1 and in John 3, which brings us back to or harkens back to Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 11, Jeremiah 32, and so forth. But that person that's born, John says that the evil or evil one cannot touch them. So the person has been born again, can have to them, born from above, born of the spirit, born of God, that the evil cannot touch. Now, I want you to notice something. And I said, I used the word God twice. Why? Even though the English didn't have that, because here it says the one that's born of, born of, get, uh, genethes, ek to theu, which is born of God, tere, which is he keeps. And this, you, this word right here is not shown in the English, uh, but it says, uh, which is, which is himself. So in other words, God himself keeps us from the evil one, from the evil. So to make the statement that you can have the Holy Spirit, which is God, in you, but you can still have a demonic presence in you, well, then how does that work if God himself is keeping us from or keeping the evil one from touching us? That doesn't make any sense, Greg. And so there is at least one passage, and there are many more, and we'll come cover some of those, but there's at least one passage there that shows that Greg Locke is wrong. You see, when a house changes ownership, if the house has rats and roaches, the new owners have a choice. They can pretend like the rats and roaches aren't there because what's going to happen is when new ownership comes into an empty house, the rats and roaches aren't going to leave. They're just going to go in the basement and the attic. So I love when people use some of these sometimes goofy analogies. Now, any, every, we all use analogies. This is a goofy one. First of all, uh, the new owner isn't just a regular owner. It's not, the, the new owner is not the same as the previous owner. In this case, the new owner is God. So he's coming into a place to clean up. You think he's going to leave the as he says, the rats and the roaches. 
we're going to look at this passage in just a little bit that, that he's kind of alluding to. But that's not how this works. Oh, by the way, let's just go over a couple more passages that the Bible brings up to tell us that you cannot have this evil spirit in you. James 4, 7 puts it this way. Submit, therefore, to God and resist the devil and he will flee. flee, flee. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Well, let me ask you a question. If you resist the devil, what's going to happen? He's going to, ref he's going to flee, including a demon. As you draw close to him, God draws near to you. And in doing so, you naturally are resisting the devil or a demon. And what does he do? He flees. Now, this is outside of you. This is not inside of you. Notice how this is put outside. of you. He's not fleeing from within. He's inside of you and you resist him. And so he flees. That's not how this works. As a matter of fact, Peter says, Peter says that the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, he's on the outside, on the inside. But what does Peter say in 1 Peter 5? Just resist him. Resist him. Stand, stand fast, firm in your faith. Resist him. That's all. That's the requirement. Because you'll notice we don't find passages in the Bible where they're telling us to after, after notice, after Acts 19, all the people groups have received the Holy Spirit. Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, and then lastly, those few disciples that are running around the countryside with John or from John the Baptist. Once they see them, we see no one um, being demonized and or being possessed or whatever you want to call it. And then them having the Holy Spirit in them and then having them, uh, the demon put out. As a matter of fact, we never see anyone with the spirit in them having a demon ever. And so uh, just following what the scriptures say, it's pretty easy to understand. Remember, Jesus is the one that makes a statement. Jesus says that, so if the son makes you free, you will be free in Indeed, this word antos is speaking about how thoroughly, how complete you are free. As a matter of fact, really free. Indeed, you are free. That's what this word is referring to. And so there's another passage, Greg Locke, that we can look to. But let's listen to more of what he's talking about, about this uh, person coming in and taking over the house. And I guess the new owners, when they came in, weren't concerned about the ratchets and roaches. They're just going to hide. So the new owners, they can either put up with it. They can deny their existence, or they can call an exterminator and cast them out. So nowhere in the Bible will you see, once you pray and trust Jesus, automatically all those demons come up out of your flesh. That is Now, I want you to pay attention to something that also that God says that, that in his word he speaks about. And I want you to notice the location of both parties. And I'm using both parties just kind of help to understand this. But in 1 John 4, look what he says, verse 4. You are from God. You are from God. That's important, guys. You are from God. Ek tu theu. You are from God, little children, and have overcome. He says you have overcome them. That is the world. Uh, that would naturally include. That would naturally include anything demonic. But he says because, and he tells us why we overcome, and we're overcomers. And notice when the Bible speaks about us as overcomers, he uses us and with a participle that we are overcoming. And so he says that uh, the reason for this is that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, notice the location of the he that's greater. That is God. And obviously, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit in us. Greater is he that's in us. Where is the he in us versus the he who is in the world speaking of the enemy? Now, that also necessarily brings in demons, any sort of demonic influence, any sort of evil. Where is he at? in the world and greater is he that is the holy spirit than anything that's in the world in other words so for a demon to come in who does he have to move so we want to use the analogy of someone coming into a house well how does the demon come into the house well jesus speaks about this that the first you must bind the strong man who's binding that strong man do you know of a demon that has the power to bind to uproot and move out the holy spirit no you don't know of one such demon nowhere contained in the context of the word of God matter of fact if you don't even appropriate the death of Christ for the curse you can be saved spirit filled love God know the Bible and preach the gospel and be under a generational curse because you never appropriated the reason Jesus died for that curse to begin with this is one of the other things that they do and there's just no biblical basis so when you hear someone talk about generational curses my recommendation is to leave them alone Never listen to them as long as they're going to advocate this issue of generational curses where God determined that these curses, by the way, it doesn't matter who does the cursing uh, of you. Anyone can curse you. But if God is the one that's behind the curse, well, then nothing's going to be done. 
But there's no such thing in the Bible as a generational curse post the new covenant. And the generational curses were only on Israel. Now, if you're going to speak about curses as it relates to uh, death, people dying, well, that if you're going to call that a generational curse and the generational curses are for when someone does something that that person's generations receive the, the consequences of the other person's sin. In other words, the sins are visited upon the father to the second, third, and fourth generation as the Bible speaks of. Well, the Bible tells us in this new covenant uh, for Israel that they will no longer have to worry about that. He says that from now on, as he says, the old proverb, that the teeth of the children are set on edge because the, their fathers ate sour grapes. He then goes on to say in Jeremiah 31, that from now on, you will be accountable to your own sins. There are no more uh, sins of the father having being put on me. Now, there are consequences. The father used up all the money. Mom and dad were were uh, not frugal enough with their money. And so the children grew up in poverty or maybe they never learned how to handle money. And so they grew up the same way. Maybe that's their kids. But that can be broken. That's not an issue. That, that's a that's a choice, not a curse. And so this issue about a curse. But as a matter of fact, there is a passage that we want to bring up dealing with this. And I want to look at it a couple ways. This is Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us written. Now, I want to go over here to, to Logos for a second, and I want to pull this up. And I want to look at something. This word that's used here for the word for redeem that we're, that Christ has done, here we have this Greek word, oxagoroxo, which is, I want you to look over here in this portion right below me, and let's make this just a little bit bigger because I want you guys to be able to read this with me. This says that uh, this is the commercial association of the verb buy, to, to buy up, to buy back. So what has Christ done? Bought us back. Therefore, if you are saved, you have been redeemed. Uh, you have been bought back. You'll also see this term uh, in the Bible uh, called lutrosin or apolutrosin, which is to buy back, to redeem, especially with the apa, it gives like a little extra force to it. We have been bought back. So the curse that hangs over the world, and by the way, it's not a generational curse, but if it were a generational curse, when you guys say that you can break generational curses, all generational curses, you're going to break that. That's never called a generational curse. That is a curse. That is something that is a condition that is put upon all mankind that everybody is going to die, whether they are saved or unsaved. And so they kind of conflate this sometimes. You're going to hear him do the exact same thing. But those of us that are in Christ, what does he say? We have been redeemed. Now, let me prove that to you. Did Jesus die for the sins of the world? Certainly he did. Is the whole world saved? No. Why? Because you have to appropriate the death. Did Jesus die as a curse to remove the curse? Yes. Is all the curse removed? No, because you have to appropriate what he did. If that makes sense, somebody clap your hands, nod your head, do a snot rocket. So now the issue is that he, he's at even undercutting his own position because if we're speaking about what Jesus did for our spiritual livelihood, then why would you bring up this issue of generational curses? Because if he died for that and the curse is gone, now, notice what he says. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, we're going to say that Jesus, is Jesus cursed? No, but he takes the place of the cursed ones or who should be cursed. And we are no longer under curse. So if you were in Christ, even if you were to hold to this foolish notion of a generational curse, well, if you are saved, what are you no longer under? A curse, according to this particular text. Praise God. Let me know you're alive. Okay. Hallelujah. So demons don't leave just because you get saved. That's why deliverance is the children's bread. They say this also, and I wish they were stopped doing. There is no such there's no such passage in the Bible that speaks of deliverance being the children's bread. The only place you even find this term children's bread is when Jesus is speaking to the woman who is the Canaanite woman or the Syrophoenician woman, and she says that um, give me this. Look what he says. As a matter of fact, let's go to Matthew 15, starting in. Um, verse 25, but she came and, and began to bow down before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it, it is not good to take the children's bread. Here it is, the children's bread and throw it to the dog. So where do we get this in this anywhere that deliverance is the children's bread? But notice what he says, uh, take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, yes, Lord, even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And now what she's referring to is her daughter being demon possessed. But to say deliverance is the children's bread, 
This is not what Jesus says. Jesus says, but I've come to say to the lost sheep of the house of Israel to make it say that deliverance is the children's bread. That is not what the pastor is saying at all. So the next time you hear them say that deliverance is the children's bread, ask them to make that make that fit, please. Do not, and we'll teach more on this when I talk about this, this beautiful, I would say new, but it's not new. It's been in the Bible for a long time. This revelatory experience God gave me. This is why we do not make a habit out of casting demons out of lost people. Now, this is where he undercuts everything that he says. Listen to what he's saying. It's a lost cause because those demons are coming back. You got to get somebody saved. If they don't repent and believe the gospel, you can call witchcraft out of them all you want to. Lost people don't need deliverance. They need redemption. Well, that's pretty much what we've been saying. But you're saying, notice how he, he his two positions juxtaposed, they're contradictory. So if lost people need, the, need salvation and they have to be saved, which is what he says, this is why we don't why we don't preach deliverance to uh, to the lost. They need to be saved. Why? Because the Holy Spirit comes in. Let's go to this passage he's talking about. Uh, Matthew 12, 43. Maybe he's talking about it. I'm not sure if he, what he's referring to. But Matthew 12, 43 says, Now when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest and does not find it. Now we don't understand how the unclean spirit leaves. We cannot necessarily assume that the unclean spirit leaves because uh, there was some sort of exorcism or deliverance minister there. We don't want to say that because if a demon comes upon a person, there's no rule that states that the demon has to stay there in the person. Maybe, say, you know what? My work here is done. Let me go. Let me go see what else I can do. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. And so we shouldn't add extra information that's just not there. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds an, it unoccupied, swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there and in the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be for this evil generation. Now, he's speaking. There's a lot there that Jesus is speaking about. He's speaking really about Israel and those particular people there. But even if you were related to some sort of ha someone having a demon, if the spirit comes back, this evil spirit comes back and the house in order, empty, there's nothing there to occupy it. Well, then he can come back in. But if the Holy Spirit is there, he cannot come back in. Notice what the text says. And this, without question, undercuts what Greg Locke or any other uh, deliverance minister is saying. If you have the Holy Spirit, you cannot have a demon. Will there be any sort of demonic activity around you? Sure. Demons don't go away simply because someone is saved. You might have a neighbor who has a demon. You might have a co-worker. You might have a, a, someone inside your house. But you can't have one. Why? because the Holy Spirit resides in you and has taken possession of you, you belong to him. And so again, greater is he, that's the Holy Spirit that's in you, than he, a demon or demonic influence that's in the world. So yeah, there's plenty of passages you can go to to show that a Christian with the Holy Spirit cannot have a demon. As a matter of fact, you can't even go in the scriptures and find an example of a Christian, someone with the Holy Spirit having a demon. So therefore, you should be able to put this to rest. They won't, but at least you should have confidence that if you are saved, you can't have a demon. If you have a demon, you're not saved. Amen. Loud.